this is The Consciousness Podcast, and I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. In this edition, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Marjorie Wollacott, author of the book Infinite Awareness, The Awakening of a Scientific Mind, which she describes as both a scientist's memoir and a research survey on human consciousness. Dr. Wollacott was a neuroscience professor at the University of Oregon for more than three decades and a meditator for almost four. She also has a master's degree in Asian studies. Her master's thesis was the foundation for her book. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. It includes both research and neuroscience in testing the efficiency of alternative forms of therapy, such as Tai Chi and meditation, for improving both attention and balance in adults. We had a great conversation about her studies and experiences around consciousness, meditation, even psi phenomena. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Marjorie Wollacott. You have an amazing story, obviously, and, and a, a great book and a lot of lectures came out of this story, but from being a neuroscientist and, and then this incredible experience through your meditation and creating these two different you know, belief systems, if you want to call it that, and how you've dealt with that, why don't you tell us a little bit about that story and get us started there? Yeah. So I think the first thing to note is that I was trained as a materialist neuroscientist, as we all have been in our university academic system. And saying that, it meant that I really believed that our consciousness was a product of the activity of neurons in our brain. And I thought that anybody else that thought otherwise was weak-minded. And I still remember going to family reunions when I was a teenager and talking to my materialist physicist uncle. And we would go off in a corner talking about our own scientific ideas and leaving the other people we thought we were weak-minded in the other parts of the room talking about things like spirituality. And we just had this very a feeling of chauvinism about our understanding about the world. And so right. <laughs> I found that was interesting then going into neuroscience, um, really becoming um, totally immersed in getting grants and writing papers and giving my all to that particular perspective. And then In 1976, when I was a young professor in a university in Virginia, my sister invited me to go to this meditation retreat in the Catskill Mountains of New York. And I had an experience in that retreat um, of meditation that opened up for me an awareness of a dimension of reality that I had never before experienced as that materialist neuroscience during all of those first years of my life until I was about 30. And I was certainly in that retreat, skeptical. I mean, because I was a materialist, but my sister had told me about it. And in fact, it was my birthday. She invited me there for my birthday. And so I said, hey, you know, I'm here for the weekend. I will be open and curious. Now, on the first morning of that retreat, we were told that the Swami, it was Swami Muktananda, in fact, um, would be coming around the room and initiating every individual there. And that initiation was described as happening through the Swami's touch. It would be a spiritual awakening that would happen through his touch. Now, again, I was skeptical, but I said, okay, I'm here for the weekend. I'll put it aside and I'll just see what will happen. I was really curious, in fact, to see what might happen. So when he reached me, what I felt was his thumb and his fingers right between my eyes and on the bridge of my nose. And I was alert. My eyes were closed, but my senses were otherwise fully engaged So when I experienced what seemed like a current of electricity going from his fingers down into my body, I had a sense of utter certainty about the event. I think that's the interesting point about most people's meditation experiences that they have. When you're having it, you are alert and this is more real than real. So, Hmm. and I should say, I didn't know precisely what was happening. And to this day, I don't understand what was happening. But it seemed as if this tiny lightning bolt leapt from his fingers to a point between my eyes and down into the center of my chest. And I could feel that exact point where the energy stopped. And it felt like my heart. It was right in the place of the heart, but not my physical heart. It was parallel to my physical heart. And it felt more real in that um, energetic sense than my physical heart ever had felt. And then I began feeling that energy radiating out filling my whole being and going beyond it. And it felt like pure nectar. I once said that if it had a color, it would have been gold. It felt like this golden nectar flowing through me. And it felt like pure love. And in fact, I remember that words went through my mind at that moment and they had nothing to do with my scientific analysis. And they were, I'm home. 
I'm home. My heart is my home. Literally, it felt like I had been somehow alienated from my truest self all of my life. And finally, there it was right in front of me, right at the center of my own being. Now, I think wow. the most astonishing to me was that afterwards, I went back to my university position in Virginia. And the very next morning, I woke up at 5 a.m. and I got up to meditate. And that happened day after day after day. And in fact, it's never stopped. And I did that because at some level, I knew that I had tapped into this experience of meditation and that I would be able to actually experience that by just quieting my mind down and going just below the surface of my awareness. So I should have say- you had any, In your meditation, have you had any other experiences similar to that, that bolt of lightning from the Swami? I have, and I think that what's first of all interesting is you raise a very interesting question that very often the first experience a person has, whether it's in meditation or whether it's a near-death experience or some other rather mystical phenomenon, is one of the biggest experiences that they have. And it's almost like your body is in a place where it's not expecting anything, it's totally open, and you get this amazing sort of like whole new understanding of reality. And then now that you've had a taste of it, it's almost as if now you have to work on all the little things that get you in the way of having that, like your attention always mm. going upward to your work or other things like that. Saying that, it, because I started meditating then every day, I would notice depending on the day I was meditating or the moment in my life, I would often go into this place that felt like the most incredible joy that I had been able ever to experience and also a sense of real peace. Like I didn't want to be anywhere else at the time. And I would just sit there in my meditation, feeling joy, feeling just the, the phenomenon of being as a wonderful, wonderful feeling and also a connection with things around me. So to me, that is one of the most wonderful experiences that you can have. And I look forward to those things happening in my meditations. I should say it doesn't happen in every meditation because often I'm distracted by work around me and productivity in one area or another. But when I can really focus in on just being present and letting go of expectations, I can often drop into that place. And I should say too that it's not as if it ends when I actually get up from meditation. I think the beauty of consistent meditation is that you actually find a way of taking that meditation into the rest of your life. So I would then go to the university and I would find that I would have much more equanimity in situations where I'd be in a department meeting and people would be arguing about one viewpoint or another on a particular departmental matter. And I could stay quiet and calm in the midst of that and actually try to bring like a, a rational and like helpful presence to the conversation rather than getting drawn up in one side or the other being right or wrong. Yeah. And uh, not to get too far into the, the meditation spiritual side of it, but you mentioned in your book that being able to calm your brain down and, and observe and be in the moment is where happiness happens. Yeah. And I think that, that's what we talked about, um, I think, a little bit in terms of some of the questions that you had asked. It's like, well, what was I really doing as a scientist starting to meditate? And I really did feel like I was trying to approach it from that scientific perspective that I had known all my life, which means I wanted to sit there and make a hypothesis about quieting my mind and then trying it out and then observing my mind and learn little by little what meditation might really be. I remember at first I thought, oh, it'll be easy to quiet your mind. I would just sit down on my meditation cushion and I should be able to do it. And I found out that's not simple at all. And <laughs> I think what I want to say to anybody else that might start, be starting to meditate is that you may have an initial experience like I did, and then you have to start doing the work, which means sitting down, focusing on your breath, maybe focusing on a, pair of, a set of syllables like I had from the tradition that I came from in India. And realizing that the goal of the focus on the breath or the syllables is to quiet the mind down, but our thoughts cover our entire day. And it's very, very difficult to form a new habit of being able to actually let those thoughts go and not be following them into one particular train of thought or another. And at first in those meditation, um, 
periods for maybe a half an hour, I would just watch all of these images come up in my mind. And I was thinking, where on earth are they coming from? I had no idea. It was simply like I had so many memories stored inside of me that wanted to spontaneously come up. It was not a quiet mind. But I began to see that the things I did in my outer life also affected my meditation. So I think I may have mentioned that if I happened to stay up very late the night before out um, going to maybe a dinner with colleagues or um, reading a book late at night or working on a big project on a grant or something like that, um, I would be really tired the next morning. And I would find that I might even drop into sleep and meditation. And you can clearly tell the difference mm. between sleep and meditation. So I was like, oh. Right. You begin to find the ways of conducting your life that help you go into a quieter state in meditation. And I think because the experience of a quiet mind is so gratifying, um, we do everything we can to try to find that place of stillness and, of course, then take it into our day. So when you were doing, when you had this, this breakthrough and you started this meditation practice, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that as a scientist, you would spend time observing your own mind during meditation, which does sound difficult given that you're releasing these thoughts, you know, but what's a, uh, and I think you've already touched on this, but just to make sure what, what were you able to observe and what were some other things you learned from that? I think one of the things I learned is that watching my mind, most of what was coming up in it was my own narrative. It was my own um, monologue that I think we all have where I would start out of then focusing on my breath or on this mantra that I use, Om Namah Shivaya, which actually means I honor that highest consciousness inside of me. And then suddenly I would notice that my mind was no longer on the breath or the mantra. And it was on what had happened yesterday with a colleague and how I could have phrased my own side of the story better, all those funny things that go on. And then I noticed that, of course, I would bring my mind back gently to the breath, etc. And what I discovered then is that what a quiet mind really was, was a place where my own internal dialogue was not dominating me. And I could actually just sit there in what I would call pure awareness or presence. And by that, what I mean is that it's not that I left my normal awareness. I could still hear like the hum of the refrigerator or a car passing outside, but they didn't bother me because my mind wasn't engaging with them. That was just something going by. And I was staying very calmly in the present moment without those thoughts that I would be running after in my typical awareness moment. So that was one of the thing I, things I learned is that it's about really letting go of that narrative that keeps me from the experience of this joy and this peace that's right inside of me waiting there for me. And what did you think from a, from a neuroscientific point of view? You know, I think that this, this race is actually a, the next big question I think that you had asked, and that is, so what is going on in terms of accessing this consciousness that we might even call non-local consciousness? In other words, mm -hmm. my local consciousness is really the local awareness and the thoughts that are going on in my brain, all of those thoughts, and a non-local consciousness for me is a place where my thoughts have subsided and I now have access to an awareness that I usually don't experience, which could be this energetic awareness of love and joy. It could be a sense of unity with other things around me, but it's a sense of pervasiveness and um, being part of a much bigger whole in a certain sense when I talk about non-local consciousness. And, and what I noticed is that in my own meditation, it happened when my mind was still. And then I began actually doing research in my own laboratory on meditation, and then also looking at other people's research on meditation. And I was intrigued as I looked at all of the different studies. And there was a very interesting study that came out in 2014 by a man named Hinterberger from Germany and his colleagues. And he actually found something that I had not seen before, and I'm hoping he actually does a lot more research on it. What he found was that when he and his colleagues looked at the EEG now um, with electrodes across the um, brain and looked at the different waveforms of EEG that you would see in normal waking consciousness or meditation, which would be like beta waves, alpha waves, theta waves, gamma waves, et cetera, delta waves, he found that when he compared people in different types of states of awareness, like just closing your eyes and being aware, letting your mind wander, versus going into what he called a thought 
free or thoughtless emptiness type of meditation, which he called similar to like a non-dual awareness. He said he found that the EEG in all of those wavelengths, all of those alpha, um, beta, gamma, delta, et cetera, all reduced in size. And I found that fascinating to me because that's in fact, as you know, what people have found in other areas of research. So he is showing that when you're in this thoughtless emptiness or non-duality state of awareness, where literally your mind is as still as you can make it, really your brain activity goes down significantly. And of course, what was interesting to me about that was that when you then look at, for example, the work that we now know about of Robin Carhart Harris and his colleagues looking at the effects mm -hmm. of psilocybin and other psychedelics on the brain, that's in fact what they're showing using functional magnetic resonance imaging. And I thought it was interesting when I looked at his data to see that what goes on with psilocybin is that you get this lowering in the activity of key networks of the brain and also a reduction in the coupling between those areas. And he says that those key areas are what he calls these hub regions. And they're areas for a scientist like the anterior cingulate cortex, the medial frontal cortex, which are all involved in executive function in the brain, decision making and things like that. So I also found it interesting that there was this direct correlation, he said, between the drop in activity in those areas of the brain and also the subjective effects of the psilocybin, such as the feeling of like a unity awareness, mystical experiences, loss of ego, et cetera. And I'm going, that is fascinating that the meditation studies and the psilocybin studies are all saying the same thing. They're saying that when you actually reduce the activity of these key areas of the brain, that's when you get into these states of unity awareness of what feels like a mystical experience where your boundaries begin to drop away and you feel a sense of oneness with everything around you. Yeah, I, I found that interesting also because it's almost contrary to what you would expect Yes, given absolutely. what you hear about the experiences of psychedelics of, of, you know, amazing visuals and the connection to other people and all these different things, you would expect the brain to be lighting up as opposed to calming down a little bit. Exactly. And I think he even says that in the beginning of his papers, he says, people originally expected that what you were really doing is hyper um, activating the brain. And that's why you were getting all of these images and other sorts of experiences. And he said, it's exactly the opposite that we found. And to me, that's also interesting, because then when you look at near death experiences, which of course, Bruce Grayson have studied very carefully, um, Dr. Pim Van Lommel from the Netherlands, Dr. Sam Parnia from the United States, mm -hmm. They all say exactly the same thing. I mean, these are MDs that have done carefully designed prospective studies. And again, by prospective study, we mean that this is a study where they start at a particular moment in time and they bring in every single person that has cardiac arrest in a network of hospitals into their study. And if that person survives, they then interview them afterwards. But during the study, they measure EEG and they show that during cardiac arrest, the EEG flatlines. And then... In those people that survive, they find that about 12 to 15% have a near-death experience, and usually about a quarter of those people actually are watching from above their body the resuscitation happening during the cardiac arrest, and they can give details of everything that was going on in that room, and often rooms that are distant in the hospital, because literally it felt to them like their awareness was able to move to different places above their body and beyond in the hospital while right. And so I say, once again, it's flatlined EEG, just like um, the same sort of thing in Robin Carhart Harris's study, where it's lowering of the activity with psilocybin, and like that meditation study of Hinterberger, where it's lowering the EEG amplitudes in all of these different parts of the brain. And so to me, it points to one particular outcome, and that is that most of the time, our brain is filtering out this what we might call higher awareness or this non-local consciousness and something happens in these different states whether it's an nde with cardiac arrest whether it's psilocybin or whether it's some of these deep states of meditation in long-term meditators for example where somehow there this inhibition of this activity is removed and we see things we wouldn't otherwise perceive yeah and i guess another part of that would be the uh the terminal lucidity 
Oh, when somebody yeah. is getting to that, that moment, uh, there, maybe there's something going on with the brain quieting down at that point that enables them to access that, that non-local consciousness. Exactly. And I think one of the things that I want to study more, and it's really an area of research that needs to have more study, is the whole issue of terminal lucidity. And again, there are people in Germany that have begun to do this type of work. Um, also, Peter Fennick from England is beginning to do this type of work. And um, Alexander Batiani is the person, by the way, doing it in Germany. And I think it's a fascinating thing where they literally have recorded um, the data from a lot of different interviews with people that have been hospice workers, for example, or medical personnel, um, when people have had dementia, for example. And then they um, simply find out what the people say happened to that patient during the last hours or minutes of their life. And I think Batiani and um, Fennec have very interesting data, which shows, at least in preliminary form, that often the person who basically had such dementia that they couldn't even talk with their family, couldn't communicate um, intelligibly at all in any clear way, would suddenly come out of that feeling of total befuddlement and say goodbye in a very sweet, clear way to every member of the family, and then a few minutes or hours later would simply die. And my neuroscientist framework doesn't accept that. I mean, the neuroscientist right. says, the brain ha neurons are diseased. There's no way once they stop functioning, they're going to come back again during the last minutes of life. But here they're doing it. So then you say, as you're saying, it's like, is it because the activity is actually getting quieter? Those um, mechanisms are actually going away that inhibit us from those experiences as we're making that transition to death. And that is the reason that maybe 10 to 15% of these people with dementia actually are able to come to this place of terminal lucidity and truly say goodbye in this beautiful way. Yeah, and it's pretty incredible, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but the other notion, because I, I interviewed Michael Nam yes. about this, and it's not only the, the conscious part of this, but also some motor skills seem to come. I mean, with, yes. like the brain is damaged, and they actually can't move, and they will sit up. Yeah. So not only are they lucid, but they surprise everybody in the room because they moved the parts of their body they couldn't move before. Yes, I think, in fact, one of so, the studies was this woman that had had a stroke on one half of her body, and then a few months later, a stroke on the other half, so she couldn't even sit up, she couldn't speak. And as you're saying, in that last minute of life, I think he says, she sits up, she raises her arm, says her husband's name, and then she dies. And you're thinking, this is impossible. Yeah, <laughs> <But it> happened. <laughs> yeah it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's really fascinating. So, you know, in your book, you've got this really great diagram about the, the non-local consciousness down to mind, down to brain, body. Mm -hmm. And is that, when we talk about this non-local awareness or non-local consciousness, is that what we're referring to? And, 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 I, and I, one of the things I like also is later in the book, you have a diagram where a thought kind of, I almost call it reflexes, out from the brain to the mind to the non-local and then comes back and it's at that point where we become aware of our actual making of a decision. So I don't know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, the actual concept of the non-local awareness or consciousness and, and maybe, you know, wrap those two things into that. Sure. And I should say that I drew that and in fact, I um, use it in my book because often just for my own self, it really helps to clarify what we're really meaning by things. And I, what I do, in fact, in that figure, if you can remember, is on the left-hand side of the figure, I show my materialist point of view when I was a young neuroscientist, which was simply that it's the activity of my neurons in my brain that is actually producing mm -hmm. my local awareness, my thoughts. And I, noted, and I make two arrows going up, showing that that's what my materialist worldview is really saying. But of course, what I note is that no neuroscientist knows how activity of neurons in the brain could create our phenomenal awareness. That's the hard problem that David Chalmers and others talk about. But I think the point is that on the um, right-hand side of my figure, I show this other point of view that more people like Ed Kelly and myself um, are beginning to really believe is the case. And that is that there is this non-local awareness um, that we access, for example, in deep states of meditation, or people may access this also in, um, for example, a near-death experience, where they can now experience 
phenomena that are beyond what their normal five senses would be able to experience through the sensory input coming into their brain. And what I'm talking about there is that that is available really all the time if we could just get rid of a lot of those filters on our brain. And normally that is filtered down through our brain's filters into what we would call our local awareness, our thoughts, et cetera, of our brain. And of course that can affect the activity in the neuron center of our brain. So my thoughts definitely influence my um, neural activity, but of course it works both ways. So my neural activity can also affect my thoughts and that can affect um, non-local awareness as well. So that's the newer understanding, the newer model that then fits the data from near-death experiences, from terminal lucidity, from these experiences people like myself have had in meditation. And I think what I like about that particular model is that we're not saying that the materialist worldview is wrong. In fact, my previous worldview that activity of neurons in the brain creates consciousness is still there in my diagram. I'm just adding to it. I'm just saying there can be other things influencing my mental awareness as well. And so it's almost like uh, an analogy. I don't even know if it's an analogy because I think it actually plays a role in what we're talking about, but it's, it's like the, uh, the physics, the evolution of physics and our understanding of it that you mentioned in your book, right? It, it, with New, Newtonian physics, you know, of the apple falling and hitting the earth. Mm -hmm. And then we get to, to quantum physics. And, you know, as we look at particles, waves, now there's the field theory mm -hmm. that, and I'm a novice here, so anybody listening, don't take this as science. But if, if you look at it as, a, as a, an electron field, that every electron is basically kind of a, a concentration of, of energy, and maybe it comes from observation that creates this electron from this field. Do you see, when you say non-local consciousness, do you, do you see those kind of things, number one, playing into it? And number two, is there an implication here that my non-local awareness and consciousness is connected to or part of the same non-local consciousness that you have? Yeah. Uh, so, and first of all, just the bottom line is, yes, I do believe that we can, and I think there have been experiments that suggest this, actually tap into the same non-local consciousness at the same time. And there have been studies about that that I find fascinating. I mean, I'll just give you one study that, uh, oh, by the way, I, I'm gonna stop here and just mention briefly that people should go to um, the website um, that was actually created by Charlie Tart called the T-A-S-T-E website, which is scientists actual mystical experiences that have perhaps changed their worldview through those experiences. And one of them was an example of two different people having exactly the same dream in the middle of the night. It was a professor and a student in one of his workshops. And in this case, the professor, um, in addition to being a university professor, was also a guitarist. And the student happened to be not only a student in his class, but also a dancer. And they both had a dream at almost the same time during the night of the two of them playing the guitar and dancing together in a particular theater. And they both wow. afterwards, and it was like, we can't explain it. But here we were both tapping in a certain sense at almost exactly the same time into the same non-local awareness. How can that happen? We don't know yet. But so the answer is yes, I do think we can do that. Some people better than others, some people at some moments more than others, but I think it's a phenomenon that deserves more research. I think if we did more research in a very careful way, we might find this phenomenon being more pervasive than we think. Yeah, that makes sense. And I agree. I hope we do more research. Yes. But now, um, go ahead. You were saying, you asked me a few more questions and I just gave you that one example. Yeah, no, that was, that was it. It's just a, uh, and maybe do you want to talk about the, the quantum physics yes, I aspect do. of this? Definitely. And, and what I want to say here, too, is it reminds me in, in physics and quantum physics of what's happening with neuroscience and our materialist worldview versus a broader worldview. And that is that quantum physics was actually um, really discovered and formulated and expanded and expounded um, in the early 1900s. And people are still learning more and more from that. And yet, it doesn't mean that Newtonian physics went away. Most of what we deal with in the world is still actually 
um, using Newtonian physics in terms of calculations and things like that, because it's very practical in the world that we live in. And it's a little bit like that with our neuroscience point of view. Much of what we do in neuroscience from the materialist point of view is very helpful in operations, in helping people with various pharmaceutical drugs to cure one thing or another. So it's not that that should be thrown away, but it's simply that um, there are other ways that um, consciousness actually can also work that can inform us, just like quantum physics can inform us about reality, even though it may not be something that we're using every single moment of the day. It's there and it can be tapped into. So the idea from quantum physics in terms of consciousness comes from people like Henry Stapp, who is a professor um, of physics at UC Berkeley, who has retired now, but who has written a number of articles and books on consciousness. And his understanding is that when you talk about the observer in quantum physics being very important for the outcome of the experiment, he says what he has done is taken that term observer and actually taken it to mean also our own conscious awareness inside of our body, making decisions about what we want to do and what we want to perceive. And he takes it down to the level of the synapse and the junction at the end of the synapse where you have, for example, calcium ions moving into the end of the synapse and causing transmitter release. And he said he feels that that's where quantum effects can actually occur in our decision making. And that's where a non-local consciousness, a higher consciousness can actually interface with the activity at a material level of the out output of the neurons in our brain, actually making a neuron fire, um, for example, more strongly, more repetitively, et cetera, to cause a particular outcome. So he's one of those people that is actually taking quantum theory and trying to look at it in relationship to what we might call the consciousness brain interface. I find his work fascinating. And again, you can look at his own articles or you can look into my book at a brief summary about that in the last chapter. Okay. So he's saying, and you're agreeing, and you're applying this in your research, that the non-local consciousness actually affects the physical brain from the outside. Yes, I think that it very well can. And I think that, again, when we even look at other people besides Henry Staff, and these are people that did research um, earlier on in um, neuroscience, they have say, said the similar sorts of things. And that is that when you simply look at our mind, our own thoughts, they definitely affect our body. And I'll just give you one example. I mean, when, for example, I have, um, for example, very um, happy, um, elated thoughts, we know that it affects all of the um, transmitters in my nervous system. And we have like what they talk about oxytocin being released. We have these um, factors that really benefit our body and make us healthy. And when we think very depressed thoughts or when we are thinking very stressed thoughts, because we think the situation is very negative, whether it is negative or not, doesn't matter. That then causes incredible stressors on the body and it affects our immune system and our immune system function is actually um, begins to deteriorate. Um, so I think that right there, we see that just just our thoughts affect the physical, uh, what would we say, the, the, the well-being of our body, and it can actually hurt, harm us, or it can make us better depending on the thoughts we're thinking. And the example that we often give, which is a powerful example, is the placebo effect. And again, in my book, I talk a fair amount about very careful research on the placebo effect that shows that if you tell a patient that they might, you don't even have to say they absolutely are, they might be receiving a pain suppressing substance, an analgesic, for example, that what will happen is that a certain percentage of those patients actually change the activity in the pain pathways of their brain, and they don't feel pain. So once again, just believing something might be true affects your brain pathways. And neuroscientists do not know how to explain how our thoughts can affect our brain because they don't know, again, how you can actually have that interface between a simple aspect of consciousness and the literal change in neural activity and immune activity function in the brain. And I think like you mentioned also, is that yeah, it actually changes the, the physical brain itself. It's not just synapses firing, it's actually the brain actually changes as a result of this influence. Absolutely. And I think that what's also interesting is that when you do look at all of the research that is done on meditation, that's the same thing that you find. I think 
one fascinating thing about meditation is that it's work that's been done by Sarah Lazar at Harvard Medical School, where she showed that if you compare the thickness of the brain in long-term meditators versus control subjects who didn't meditate, and you look at people that are now in their 50s and 60s, et cetera, they have a thicker cortex in key areas of the brain than people who don't meditate. So once again, you've turned something that was functional happening in the moment over the long term into something that was structural, which is a benefit to the brain. And there are changes in the circuitry, changes in the size of different parts of the brain, all related to, in this case, simply quieting your mind during meditation. Yeah, I'm smiling because I, I like in your book how you mention that some scientists say, oh, well, that's just because meditators are weird. <laughs> that's right. Right, and that, that's, that's their explanation. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the beauty of Sarah Lazar is when she realized that was the case, when people saw her data, that she said, okay, I'm going to take just ordinary people, and I am going to put them into a study where they meditate for X number of weeks, like about eight weeks or something like that. And then I'm going to compare them to people who haven't been in that study. And then once again, she showed the same sorts of things happening so that you can prove that it's not just because the meditator is vegetarian or weird, as we say, that it can happen to anyone that goes into that longer term training. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to uh, Dean Radin and his, his experiments and the, the different in effect of the outcomes between meditators and non-meditators. Yeah. I think that's the other thing I find fascinating. We're saying, well, what is really going on in meditation? Well, one thing we know is that meditators seem to be able to access this non-local consciousness, we might call it, more than non-meditators. And Dean Radin's studies are in a perfect example of that, where he asks the meditators to actually change the output of a random number generator just through their own thought processes, their own intention, and they are significantly better than non-meditators at doing that. So somehow they are able, through their own intention, their own will, to affect a machine that they are not connected to, which they shouldn't be able to according to materialist neuroscience. Right. Yeah, that was pretty incredible. Um, I think that you've probably already answered this question, but, you know, given everything, the, the uh, non-local awareness, the, the top-down architecture, um, where, how would you define or describe consciousness? And, you know, I talked to a lot of philosophers and some neuroscientists. I mean, so how, these days, how do you define, describe uh, consciousness itself. And I know kind of combine an, another question here. I, I see you've got, um, you know, panpsychist, panpsychist idealist views on this. So kind of tell us what are your, your thoughts on what consciousness actually is and, and what your thoughts are on it. Yeah. And I want to say that because I have been a neuroscientist for all of these years and I just recently retired and also because after I had this meditative awakening. I also began to study Eastern philosophies. I began to try to mm. understand consciousness from both perspectives and put them into one integrated whole. And I should say that um, I think you, you mentioned at one point a phrase um, that I may have used in some interview, all that is consciousness. And what do we really mean by that? And what I think about that term, all this is consciousness, is that it's a term that's both used in Eastern philosophy and in neuroscience. And I'll give you the example, first of all, from Eastern philosophy. So those people that may come more from that spiritual side of things, what is literally meant by this is that that non-local consciousness that we were just talking about in that model that I gave would be what we're calling um, and a transcendent form of consciousness, being that it's not necessarily a material consciousness, but we can tap into it at any time. And as you said, two people could tap into it at the same time, perhaps, and have um, what we might call non-local communication, where they might be actually thinking of exactly the same thing at the same time. Now, that would be what we call, again, this transcendent form of this consciousness. But when that consciousness actually then um, moves into creation, we might say, of this universe, that consciousness actually moves into every single thing that is created. So there is both a transcendent aspect of the consciousness and what we might call an imminent aspect of that consciousness, so that every aspect of creation has an element of consciousness in it. And I think the thing to realize is that element of consciousness is for example, very, very coarse at the level of, for example, a single um, cell organism, like a paramecium. And it's very, very complex and refined in these higher um, animals, um, 
whether you know they're vertebrates or primates or whatever else, but still consciousness is present there. So that's what we're really meaning by the term all this is consciousness in Eastern philosophy, for example. And when we talk about Western neuroscience, I think that it's beginning to change. At first, um, in fact, probably still many neuroscientists would say that absolutely cannot be true. Consciousness only is a product of neurons in the brain and that's it. And it only happens in certain animals, for example. But as we were talking about, more neuroscientists are beginning to accept this idea of panpsychism. And, and we note that panpsychism has different definitions from different people. And I'll give you both of those definitions. So I know that some neuroscientists, like, for example, Christoph Koch and I think probably Giulio Tononi, say that what they mean by panpsychism is simply that all these different um, levels of, for example, um, material reality, whether it's a single-celled organism or um, an insect or something like that, have their own level of consciousness. But when that organism dies, the consciousness goes away. So it doesn't survive the life of the organism. And so they're talking about a panpsychism, which is what I think Ed Kelly and others and myself would call a bottom-up form of panpsychism, meaning that it's mm. just part of material reality, but that's it. There's no transcendent consciousness. That just does not exist. But the other form of panpsychism that people like Ed Kelly, myself, um, Gary Schwartz, et cetera, um, are beginning to really embrace is that idea that there is a panpsychism that actually goes beyond just the material. And in fact, consciousness is primary in our panpsychism. And I think that's the most important point is that then that consciousness contracts into the material world, that it is both transcendent and it is imminent, for example. Okay. So there's, I, if I get this right, there's the, the non-local consciousness mm -hmm. and it transcends down into creatures yeah. in, in, in our consciousness and there's a there's a, a consciousness everywhere that permeates is there a moment at which consciousness um emerges or i'm thinking under that view it's actually always there it's always there exactly because so it came from that exactly so i think that that's the interesting thing i i would say that it's not like it emerges per se in this um what I would call this panpsychic idealist perspective. Idealism simply means that consciousness is primary. So in that case, it's not that it emerges because it's always there. It simply moves, um, for example, into material form or it moves mm. into material form. So when you think about a person with a near-death experience, their consciousness is in material form in their body and then their heart stops and their consciousness simply then moves what um, appears to be like outside of their body to be able to um, actually embrace something much more non-local and watch things that they wouldn't have been able to see with their five senses. I always wonder about the ego and, and in talking to you, I almost wonder if the, the self or the ego is a psychological thing that almost has nothing to do with what we're talking about. You know, that's kind of the, the impression I'm feeling, but I think at one point you mentioned self as an illusion and I don't know, you know, Keith Frankish and, and Daniel Dennett and their notion that consciousness is an illusion. I don't know if that's kind of where this is, but do you have any thoughts on the ego or should we just move on? No, I, I think the ego is fascinating because most people, including we neuroscientists that begin to try to work with our own um, understanding of awareness and move into that non-local awareness, find that this notion of ego, whatever that is, as you say, maybe it's a psychological construct, but it feels very real, is one of our biggest barriers <laughs> to actually experiencing some peace and happiness and experience. Right. So here's my own understanding of ego. I think of what ego is for me is my sense of separation from everything else around me. It's my sense of my smallness. It's my sense of my incompleteness. And I think when I meditate and I quiet my mind, that feeling diminishes and I feel more of a sense of unity with other people. And I have a sense that everything is just fine as it is. I don't need to like get one more grant, one more paper, et cetera, to be a better person, a better scientist. So I think it's also interesting that in Eastern philosophy, they talk a lot about the ego in their own ways. They may not use that term, but what they talk about, in fact, is when some person, for example, um, comes into a physical body, a physical being. And so here I am now. One of the things that happens when I come into this physical manifestation is that there are veils over my non-local 
a complete understanding of what awareness is that begin to cover me as I inhabit this body. And they call these malas. That is an M-A-L-A, -A, a mala. And literally it means a veil in a certain sense or a taint over the perfection of um, what I originally knew. And the first of these veils or coverings that comes over us is called anava mala, A-N-A-V-A, -A, mala. And what it means is our sense of incompleteness or our sense of being unworthy, like we need to do something to actually become worthy or complete or perfect. And so the first thing we start doing is like trying to get the right career, get more money, get this, get that, get that. I mean, prove myself to others that I am somehow a, a, a reasonably good human being. And that is my ego. And what then meditation is about is little by little, like trying to um, carve away that veil, that dust that is surrounding my real identity so that I can see my unity with other people. And when I begin to see my unity with other people, I begin to feel non-different from them. I begin to have empathy for them. I begin to have empathy for my planet that I live on and see the sacredness in it. And it changes all of my actions. I no longer have that feeling of it's me versus you or them, but I see that we're all part of this beautiful awareness. It changes everything, but it's hard to hold on to because the ego is so strong. Yeah, it's interesting. It's another common, common theory here or common concept of being connected. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. And in the psilocybin research, the meditation research, the near-death experience research, that's what almost everyone experiences is that sense of a broader connection and a sense of love and of being loved. Like whatever happens when those inhibitory pathways in your brain are um, removed, when they, you let go of that inhibition, something else emerges, which makes you feel this unity awareness, which is actually very healthy for our relationship with others on our planet. And it is one of those things that's common to all these. So where does it come from and why and why? And I feel like, you know, your explanation of this non-local awareness of consciousness is, is one of the few really intriguing theories on that. Thank you. So this, this architecture of consciousness, the non-local, the mind, the body, one of the things that you talk about is that the, the brain, or is it the mind or maybe both, at different levels are filters yeah. on this, this higher consciousness. Um, and from your background, you know, you mentioned how the nervous system filters all this input. And I think one of the things you mentioned is as you and I both sit here, our, our nervous system is bringing in so much data that it can't really process it for me right now. All I can focus in is on you and my questions and my equipment right here. And so the nervous system naturally does that. And you talk about that same notion happening with that, the, the infinite awareness, you know, being filtered. So can you talk a little bit about how that filtering happens? Is it, a, is it partly brain function, mind function? Yeah. Um, you know, what's going on as far as that filtering of this greater consciousness? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a fascinating question. And I know that people have been talking about that since the late 1800s and early 1900s with William James, who probably Ed Kelly mentioned as well, because he was a professor at Harvard University in psychology. And he understood this concept as being one of the key issues in our limited awareness. And I think it's interesting that James was one of the first proponents of that with a few other people. And then more recently, when we began learning more about the structures in the brain, um, other people have actually um, put it into modern neuroscience. And one of those is a man named Donald Broadbent. And Broadbent was one of the first people that talked about filtering um, through our brain pathways of our attention. He talked about attentional filters. And what he was simply saying was just what you were saying. There is so much information coming in that if we didn't have the attentional filters, we could not even deal with the information and process it well enough to stay alive as animals, as human beings, etc. So this is a very evolutionary appropriate thing to do to go ahead and create attentional filters within our brain. But of course, what it also does is it filters out these abilities to have this sense of non-local awareness that leads to more unitive consciousness. And so according to the people like um, William James, um, Ed Kelly, others, myself, were saying that, yes, those filters exist and they're evolutionarily appropriate, but when we can 
quiet down those pathways that I might call some of these inhibitory pathways to this like wider awareness, then we begin to taste something that we usually can't taste. And when I use the word taste, I'm meaning that sense of unity, that sense of peace, that sense of love, that sense of being um, good enough as we are so we don't feel that competition with everyone around us. And I think that as we do more and more research, for example, the research by um, Carhart Harris and um, research on meditation and near-death experiences, this may become more obvious as to exactly what parts of the brain are critical at inhibiting that wider awareness and how we can begin to let go of those parts of the brain, um, at least in certain moments of our life, and or keep those inhibited at, while we are awake and find a way of actually finding a balance between being open to that broader awareness and being able to be solidly grounded in this world so that we act efficiently in this world. Yeah, and it's a, it's a note I made, you know, Aldous Huxley, you know, wrote his Doors of Perception based on his mescaline experience, Yeah. Um, inspired the Doors to name their band after that. And it's, this, it's ironic, you know, he talked about opening up a door of perception, but like you mentioned, these, these different doors into this, non-local awareness or actually a calming, calming of the brain. Yes, and I think that it's interesting. It is, it's one of those paradoxes. Yes, it's a door of perception if you mean non-local perception, but it's not a door of our normal five senses perception necessarily, though it may feel like it. That's that very interesting thing of like, what is our perception if when somebody has a near-death experience, when their whole cortex is basically um, non-functional, and they see everything as brighter and as more, what is the word, more clear, the clarity, the colors are so vibrant, it tells me that their perception is certainly greater, but it's not a perception through the activity of the neurons in their cortex because those aren't functioning. <laughs> right. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, affecting this filter. Exactly, whatever that filter is. And I think that that is the big question for what we will be doing next in neuroscience in this post-materialist um, part of our um, exploration in science is that we really need to understand what is going on between the neurons in the brain and this higher consciousness and how the two interact and what is the optimal level of interaction and how we can facilitate that perhaps in children with education from the time they're very, very young. And um, also of course in adults so that more of our day can be spent in that perfectly balanced place between not being, for example, too spacey as a few people might be, but also not being so grounded that we lose our sense of connection with others and, um, and our planet. Um. What, uh, what's your view on consciousness surviving death? I'm slowing down on my question because I think you've essentially given me the answer without explicitly saying it. But, you know, what, what, is your, your, what are your thoughts on consciousness? You know, we talked about near-death experience. Mm -hmm. But what are your thoughts about when the body and the brain are actually gone? What that consciousness that actually created this reality and reaches down into the brain it's still there, right? It's still there, exactly. And of course, the issue is that um, if you were to ask different people who meditate or different scientists, different philosophers this question, you would probably get many, many different answers. And that's because people have had so many different experiences that they share through a near-death experience or when Ian Stevenson looked at his cases suggestive of reincarnation. And maybe I'll just start right there. I'll take a step back. I want to mention that Again, when I was a neuroscientist, before I started writing my book, I did not even look at literature on things like reincarnation because I, quote unquote, knew this couldn't exist. It didn't fit into my material worldview. And then as I began to write my book, and I actually looked at the cases that Ian Stevenson, who was again, he was a professor at the University of Virginia in psychiatry, um, very um, well educated in terms of his research background, when he began collecting these cases of these young children that were like two and a half, three years of age um, from all over the world who said, I actually belong to another family and I don't know how I got into your family, but they told about a previous identity and had all of the details on it and he could actually find the previous family in a different place and prove that the child was giving absolute and um, accurate evidence about the person he or she said they were. Um, he said, look, I have... 2,500 or more cases of these things, it's like, I don't say that proves 
the existence of consciousness beyond death. But I say it certainly is evidence we should consider that perhaps reincarnation um, could exist and we should look into it more carefully. When I read those studies of his and I looked at them very, very carefully, I said, how can I just actually put this data aside as not being true when he has so carefully accumulated case after case after case? And I think that, so that's one level of evidence that makes me believe that consciousness survives death. Of course, there's the near-death research that we've already talked about. And there's also another level of research that I didn't talk in my, about in my book because I should say, for some reason, I was less comfortable with it at the time. If I were to write a sequel to my book, I might include it. And that is all this research that has been done in scientific laboratories, including Ed Kelly's laboratory at the University of Virginia, Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona, on mediumship and the ability of certain humans to be able to contact the spirit of somebody who has died and give information from that spirit to a loved one who is still living, that is what we call evidential mediumship, meaning that they tell the person, the loved one who is still alive, things the person didn't even know but could verify later on were true from that person on the other side. Now, they again have done very careful research on this, and it seems that certain people, certain mediums are very good at doing this. Some people are not just like some people are good meditators and some are not. But I think they know that certain people seem to have an ability that goes beyond what my materialist viewpoint would explain about somebody being able to give information um, about a person who has died from the other side. And one of the people that I um, actually know that Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona has worked with is Suzanne Giesman. And I highly recommend going on her website and also reading her books because, again, reading her books has convinced me that this is a real phenomenon and that there are many people out there that can do it. Well, I look forward to that sequel. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you're right. And it's, uh, you know, the, the mediums get the same reaction that others do, meditators. N number one, quote, that's impossible, which is not a good explanation. And two, oh, either the, the people they're working with are gullible or there's a trick. And, and again, that's not really an explanation. That's just a dismissal. Yeah, and I think what's interesting when I've looked at the people, the pro and the cons on mediumship, what usually happens is the people, again, which would be like myself in the past, um, who don't believe in it would say, well, I heard such and such a person was a fake, or they had one session where clearly this couldn't have happened or something like that, and therefore they threw out all mediumship. And I swear there are a lot of MDs, doctors, who also are not really good doctors, and they do things that are unethical or inappropriate, and we nevertheless don't throw out all the rest of the doctors with that one person. And I think we always have to be careful when we're looking at any particular area that we want to do research in, at, at looking at everyone and saying maybe there is somebody who's a fraud as a doctor or as a medium, and that's okay, but there are also a lot of mediums that are absolutely authentic, and we can tell by looking carefully at the evidence that they pre begin to bring to a particular session of, of a scientific experiment or something. Um, you know, given all this experience and the fact that, you know, you, you taught neuroscience and we're in academia, do you think that neuroscience as, as a, a field of study should evolve or is it already evolving with these new uh, discoveries? And I think that's a very interesting question. And I just have to laugh because um, I should say that if I were to teach a course in neuroscience at the university tomorrow, as I taught for all of those years, it would be probably 95% materialist neuroscience because that's the practical side of neuroscience for somebody that wants to be a physical therapist or an MD or a nurse or whatever, uh, or a neuroscientist doing research. And I would probably then include some of this research that says that for example, consciousness is more than just the product of neurons in our brain because I want my students to be awakened to this expanded view that also can influence how they might treat their patients. Maybe they want to treat their patients with something like energy healing, and here is the research on energy healing that shows that it can be effective. For example, research from Yale University Medical School that says Reiki, a form of energy healing, actually improves the outcome of heart attacks in cardiac patients. So what I would try to do is give them the nuts and bolts, but then I would also add in the other because I think that I want them to expand their view and not throw this information out because they're just a very um, rigid materialist. 
saying that, I think that depending on the neuroscientist, you would have just the materialist worldview, or you would have someone like myself adding something else in. And the neuroscientists that might do that would, again, be people like Ed Kelly, Gary Schwartz, other people who are in academics. And I should also mention another person, Iman Svarus, is in um, Canada um, at a university in a neuroscience program, and he has consciousness-based courses in a psychology program. So I know that there are people out there, but they are currently few and far between. Right, right. That makes sense. So what about the, the, these studies, um, you know, everything you've studied and the people you've referred to, um, do you see anything coming that really excites you about the study of, of consciousness and neuroscience or anything around this? Well, I do. And I want to even take a, a pause right now to say that I and Gary Schwartz have just created a new academy called the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Sciences. And we have, as our board, people that you have interviewed before, like Dean Radin, for example. Also, we have Larry Dossi, an MD, who has written a lot on this type of thing. Um, we have Charlie Tart, another um, university professor that's written a lot on consciousness being primary researchers, research related to that type of thing. And so what we're trying to do is to create this academy for the advancement of post-material sciences that will actually encourage young researchers young professors at universities to begin to explore this by actually trying to give them support in perhaps getting grants, in the tenure process, in publishing papers, so that we will have a new group of young people really helping to move this area forward. So we're really excited about it. The Society has basically a new website, and it's called aapsglobal.org. Com, I believe, and I encourage people to look at that and become a member. Um, basically, one can be a scientist or one can be a layperson as a member. And the whole idea is advancing research and knowledge in this new area. We'll probably be putting out courses online. We have our first book that will be coming out soon related to consciousness and the question of whether it is primary or not. Wonderful. I'm excited about that. I will sure to be uh, keeping up with you guys on that. Yes. And then in terms of what um, actually will be coming out, I think most of the people on the board and other people doing this research have specific areas of interest that they feel have been under-researched. And one of mine is the end-of-life transition. So what I'm hoping to do is actually look more at um, terminal lucidity and other aspects of the end-of-life transition where you have someone communicating with a loved one, say, 3,000 miles away or half a world away, and collecting evidence about those things where it's very, very clear that the person couldn't have gotten this information before they did from any um, other means besides non-local communication and really giving more research dollars into looking at this sort of thing because I think it's a very, very important aspect of science. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's, it's both uh, practical in terms of all of us humans wanting to know what's going on and what's happening and what to expect or, or all with our families, and our loved ones, but also in a practical science and philosophical point of view to get a, a much deeper understanding of what, what is up there and what's going on with our consciousness. Yes, exactly. Well, wonderful. Well, uh, Marjorie, I, uh, that's all the questions I had. Did you have anything else that you wanted to, to get out there? No, I think that's fine. You covered everything very beautifully. Thank you so much. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast at our Twitter handle at ConchCast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.